Vin Diesel's career launched because of the 2000 film Riddick, where he played Richard B. Riddick, a superhuman being from the planet Furia. With news that Vin Diesel and director David Twohey are returning for a fourth Riddick film, it only makes sense that we explored Riddick's entire life, from his birth right up until his last appearance in the 2013 film Riddick. In this video, we will chalk out all the major events from his life and explore every source, including movies, games, and comics. So without further ado, let's begin, shall we? But before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. Quest. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Early Life Riddick's tale starts off on Furia, a planet that churns out some super tough characters, and he's no exception. This guy was practically born with muscles and stamina that would put the average Furian taught to shame. Now that brings us to the question of who the Furians are. These guys are basically humans who live on a super harsh planet called Furia. It was because of these nigh uninhabitable circumstances that Furians became resilient and strong as a species. But muscles and strength do not bring you a prosperous life or a happy childhood, and Riddick was no stranger to this. Let's meet Zyla, a necromonger officer with a paranoia streak a mile wide. Again, who are the necromongers? Well, these are another variant of humans who believe in a twisted religion called necroism, which basically believes that all life should be purged from the universe so that the universe can be reborn as the underverse. Needless to say, these are the bad guys, damned mongers of all things Necro. Anyway, Xyla hears from a fortune teller, possibly Arion, that his downfall will be brought about by a young Furian male. Like any self-respecting son of a witch, Xyla decides to go on a baby throttling spree to dodge his deadly fate. His mission was to wipe out all Furian boys, with Riddick nearly dying before he could even wail his first cry. Xyla thought he dodged a bullet, but little did he know, one baby boy slipped through his fingers. Of course, this infant survivor was Riddick. Who saved Riddick, or how he managed to escape the planet, remains a mystery. Officially, his birthplace is unknown, so it can only mean that his rescuer kept mum about his roots. As for his childhood, it's a bit of a black box. But if we piece together his own words, it becomes fairly clear that Riddick got his education courtesy of the penal system. In other words, the school of hard knocks was his alma mater, which reminds me of Bane from the DC Universe, who also received his formal education in a prison from its inmates. Growing up, Riddick was fed with fake stories and a twisted tale knotted up in his mind. He believed that his mom tried to kill him right as he came into the world and chucked him into a liquor store dumpster. This story, probably drummed into him by folks who didn't give two hoots about his self-esteem, colored his early years with shades of betrayal and survival against the odds. Later, Riddick started getting these flashes of a Furian lady named Shira. He initially thought that it was just his brain messing with him, until the pieces of his shattered past began to click into place. It wasn't until his run-in with the necromongers that the floodgates burst open, washing away the fiction he'd been fed. He finally learned about a planet he could call home and a history soaked in tragedy he'd never known was his getting trained. Riddick's journey from a greenhorn to a seasoned company ranger did not happen in a day. In his early days, he mastered the art of piloting ships, a skill that came in handy more than once. His work life basically started on Sigma-3, where he was a sweeper who was tasked with luring out Spitfires from the tunnels, a job that asked you to dance with danger. Why? Well, Spitfires were huge, slimy, venom-spitting lizards with motion sensors for eyes. Riddick and his team struggled against the Spitfires, and what made it worse was the fact that their roles were decided by the roll of the dice. Literally. Let's just say Riddick had zero intentions of leaving his fate to chance, so he mastered the art of dice cheating to avoid being the Spitfire's dinner. The dark underbelly of the company was laid bare to Riddick during his time at Sigma 3. He got a taste of the corruption and greed that fueled their operations, but he did not like any of this and wanted to check the prevalent corruption. Unfortunately, his concerns were rebuffed. One promotion later, he found himself in the Strike Force Academy, where he honed 
his skills further. But when he returned to Sigma-3, this time as a security enforcer, he saw the reality of what security personnel had to actually do, oppression and brutality. Once again, he spoke out against the company's draconian practices, but instead of sparking change, he found himself sent to deep storage, which was one of the most inhumane prisons of the franchise and a place meant to silence voices like his. Prison Breaks Some time later, he was sent to the Ribald S. Correctional, where he stayed for almost three years. He didn't just walk out of the door, he blasted it off its hinges. While escaping, he snatched a guard's uniform and made Swiss cheese out of two guards and a pilot to hitch a ride off-planet on the only space freighter that was present in the vicinity. That little stunt landed him on the company's naughty list with a one million credit bounty on his head. This also made him the galaxy's most wanted across five planets in three systems. Bounty hunters, bushwhackers, and mercenaries were lining up for a shot at Riddick. Riddick, on the other hand, turned the tables, and with each hunter he eliminated, his reputation as a serial killer got another boost. Playing cat and mouse with the galaxy's finest, Riddick became a legend in the prison circuit. Hubble Bay, Tangier's penal colony, you name it. He even had a sit-down with Dr. Snyder at Psychological Restraint Station Q9, whose diagnosis said that Riddick was a violent sociopath and murderer, but no prison could hold him for long. During one of his grand exits, he traveled with a mercenary crew, beefing up a squad of ETAC soldiers in the Wailing Wars. Out of 500 tough people, Riddick was the lone wolf walking out, which sparked whispers that he might have turned on his own. True or not, Riddick's name became synonymous with survival against impossible odds. Pitch Black Slam City 2000, prequel to Pitch Black. Riddick's stay on Ursa Luna, aka Slam City, was a short stay, but what a stay it was. He was in cryosleep when he was sent there, courtesy of a couple of hired guns who were looking to cash in on the bounty on Riddick's head. Naturally, Slam City's boss wanted to confirm if the goods were alive, and it was then that Riddick sprang into action. He wasted no time in wasting one Merc and then went on to steal cash and cigarettes for the road. To avoid detection, he slipped into the underbelly of Slam City. But the shadows were too much for the anti-hero, so he did the only thing he could to see in the dark. Yet, he took on the guards and Shiners. Now, if you're not aware, the Shiners were basically humans with mentally augmented night vision. But wait, it was here that Riddick got his super special eyes. The tussle with the Shiners cost him his cash, and Riddick bumped into Cutter, the doctor who could turn regular eyes into night vision ones. Trading cigarettes for surgery, Riddick got himself a pair of eyes that could see in darkness. So yeah, the motion comic titled Slam City is quite a crucial part of the Riddick universe. Anyway, as I hinted earlier, his stint in Slam was more a pit stop than a sentence. Needless to say, Riddick ghosted through the gauntlet, leaving chaos in his wake. While escaping, he stole a medtech's uniform, killed a couple of guards, and stole a spaceship. Basically, his entire stay in Slam City lasted only about 11 hours and 22 minutes. The news of his escape filled every corner of Slam City, and people sprung into action to find him. Leading the operations was William J. Johns, shotgun in hand and badge on the chest, ready to track down the galaxy's most elusive shadow. But the folks at Ursa Luna were so spooked by Riddick's latest stunt that they simply didn't want Riddick to be brought back. Instead, they pointed Johns towards the Hubble Bay Penal Facility, hoping to offload their nightmare to someone else's doorstep. Interestingly enough, this eye shine origin was kind of retconned in the Butcher Bay game. Let's find out what happened in the game and how he got his eye shine night vision. Escape from Butcher Bay After his stint in Slam City, Riddick found himself on the wrong end of Johns' shotgun again. This time around, he got a one-way ticket to the Butcher Bay Correctional Facility. Actually, not quite a one-way ticket, because it's Riddick we're talking about, a man who has a knack for escaping prisons. While Johns haggled over his bounty with Warden Hoxie, Riddick was escorted to the most secure wing of the prison by Abbott, the head of the prison guards. I don't have to tell you that Butcher Bay didn't know who it was dealing with. Riddick quickly 
eventually got the lay of the land from Abbott's tour. It wasn't long before he turned the tables with the help of a riot he sparked by taking down Rust, Abbott's right-hand man and the big fish of the prison yard. In the chaos, Riddick slipped into the shadows of the sewer system and got into a scuffle with mutants that called the Dark Underbelly their home. Down in the depths, he crossed paths with Pope Joe, an old-timer with a healer's touch. A deal was struck, Riddick's arm for a lost radio. Post-op, Riddick's world went from pitch black to night vision green, thanks to a mystical nudge from She-Ra. Using his new night vision to travel through the dark corners of Butcher Bay, Riddick nearly turned Abbott into a retinal scan keycard. Unfortunately, his breakout was inches from success when Johns and Hoxie nabbed him. This time around, Riddick landed in Butcher Bay's Double Max facility. Well, he earned it. But Riddick had no intentions of staying imprisoned and quickly set his sights on the mining facility, which was supposed to be a ticket to freedom. But freedom in Butcher Bay comes at a price. After a final fight with Abbott, Riddick teamed up with Jagger Valance, the man with the plan and influence to match. They decided that they would use a bomb to create a distraction and escape. But, as luck would have it, the guards caught wind of their plan. However, while the bomb was being transferred, it detonated, and the explosion let loose a horde of creatures called Xenos. So yeah, that became a double dose of chaos. First the bomb, and then the creatures. In the midst of this madness, Riddick nearly settled his score with Johns for good, but a stray bullet from Jagger changed the game and sent both Riddick and his plans off course. Of course, Triple Max was next, a place ruled by cryosleep and fleeting freedom. But Riddick found a loophole in their unbreakable system. Hijacking a heavy guard, he blazed through Butcher Bay straight to Hoxie's quarters. In the end, he stole a ship and successfully escaped from Butcher Bay. The Chronicles of Riddick, Assault on Dark Athena Picking up right where the Butcher Bay breakout left off, Richard B. Riddick, the notorious space felon with eyes that cut through the darkness, found himself in another tight spot. This time he was in a cryosleep next to Johns, his frenemy, only to be yanked into a new mess aboard the Dark Athena. This hulking mercenary ship, under the iron fist of Gail Rivas and her right-hand man Spinner, was not really a ride that any sane person would want to hitch. Anyway, Johns soon gets carted off by Revis's team, and Riddick slips back into his element. You know, the whole shadows and stealth thing. The Dark Athena was packed with guard drones, which were basically cyborgs on autopilot, but they didn't prove to be much of a problem for Riddick. Later in the air vents, Riddick bumps into Lynn, a little girl playing hide-and-seek with Fate, and definitely someone who reminded me of Newt from the second Alien movie. Later, he would also find her mom, Ellen Silverman, the former captain, before Revis staged her mutiny. Ellen's crafting skills are promised in exchange for a little scavenger hunt Riddick's gotta do to make an air vent escape kit. Meanwhile, Riddick assigned himself another side mission by playing hero to find Lynn at her mom's behest. Another person of interest here was Max Datcher, a guy who had technical know-how the size of an ocean. He strikes a deal with Riddick, according to which Riddick would find Max a comlink and Max would make it easier for Riddick to leave Dark Athena. Riddick gets to work and manages to gather what's needed to grease the wheels of the Freedom Chariot. After scoring the escape tools from Silverman, Riddick contacts Datcher via video communication and frees most of the prisoners. But the worst comes to place when Silverman is killed, which leaves young Lin alone. The prisoners get a shot at Freedom, but it's a bloodbath. Apart from Silverman, the tech wizard Datcher becomes a casualty. Additionally, Revis's cold-blooded efficiency leaves little room for hope. And yet, Riddick's fight with Revis leaves her dead. But as he's about to jet off in an escape pod, young Lin makes a last-minute plea to come along. But the anti-heroic anti-villain doesn't really pay any attention to her. Riddick's getaway is cut short by a missile from a not-so-dead Revis, which crashes him onto the shores of Aguera Prime. The planet was more or less a ghost town that was caught in the crosshairs of Revis drone-making operation. Riddick had one option to dodge this bullet, hitch a ride back on the Dark Athena. Battling through the city to the port, he squares off against Spinner in a mech suit and boards the ship once more. It is revealed that Lynn also had a trick up her sleeve. You see, she could turn the drones against Revis's goons, which actually sparked an all-out war on board. Riddick's final face-off with Revis in her battle suit ends with a push into the elevator shaft, which finally seals her fate for good. As the dust settles, Lynn joins Riddick, questioning if Revis could return, and he only responds with, When I say goodbye, it's forever, before the credits roll. 
Riddick can dodge death, but not John's. After splitting with Lynn, Riddick's trail went cold until he appeared again at a bustling marketplace on Aquila Major. Trying to blend in with the crowd, he found out the hard way that hiding in plain sight isn't his strong suit, especially with John's on his tail like a shadow. Not one to stay cornered, Riddick had a brief run-in with the Rikengols, a band of pirates who found out too late that their ship was better off in Riddick's hands. With the pirates out of the picture, Riddick made his next pit stop at Outskirts, a place where even shadows check the darkness for Riddick. But Johns, relentless as ever, caught up with him near a brothel. So, is it safe to say that Riddick can dodge death but not Johns? Lupus V was next on the map, where a mercenary by the name of Dresden thought he could cash in on Riddick. That idea got nipped in the bud real quick. The chase took a turn in the conga system, where Johns played his trump card, using children in peril as bait. Riddick, tough as nails but not heartless, walked right into Johns' trap. With Riddick finally in tow, Johns decided to steer clear of any more drama by taking a ghost lane. Good night. Pitch Black. And now, let's get into the first movie of the franchise that practically took Hollywood and millions of sci-fi fans by surprise. 22 weeks into its journey, while everyone on the Hunter Gratzner is out cold in cryosleep, the ship ran into trouble. The said trouble was the most curious kind, a comet's tail that wasn't on the itinerary. Debris punches through the hull, chaos ensues, and the captain dies along with a chunk of the crew. Carolyn Fry, the docking pilot, manages to crash land the ship on planet M6117, a place that's all desert and daylight, thanks to its triple sun setup. Amidst the wreckage, Riddick, our resident escape artist, slips his chains and decides to vanish into the scenery, leaving Johns in the dust. Holed up in a boneyard nearby, Riddick's got ears on Johns and Fry, hashing out the crash. His plan to ghost Fry for almost ditching the passengers changes when he learns Owens is the actual person of interest. So what does Riddick do? He leaves a little memento by snipping off a lock of Fry's hair. Later, Zeke, one of the survivors, gets jittery and kills another, mistaking him for Riddick, who is actually watching the drama unfold from a distance. When Zeke meets his end courtesy of Bioraptors in a hole, Johns manages to slap the cuffs on Riddick again. Accusations fly, but Riddick points out there's bigger fish to fry than him. With creatures lurking and the crew freaked, Riddick strikes a deal, his help for freedom. On their way back, he casually introduces himself to Paris, and even goes on to make himself at home with Paris's liquor stash. Now, we've explored the Bioraptors in a separate video altogether. I think you should check it out. It's totally worth your time. Riddick's stint on M6117 was gonna be a super wild ride. He started off as a captive, but turned into a crucial ally, all while keeping it cool under three suns and amidst creatures of nightmares, aka Bioraptors. At the settlement, the crew stumbles upon a supply of water and a spaceship ripe for the take a clear jackpot. The only catch was that there was no power in the battery to make a getaway. Riddick asks Fry about the skiff's health check. He knows she's onto his flying chops and nudges her skepticism towards John's by revealing his drug habit. Unfortunately, another survivor, a kid by the name of Ali, gets taken out by a swarm of bioraptors. Stumbling upon an orrery, they clock that an eclipse is on the horizon, ready to dunk the planet into a blackout. Now, one thing you should know about the bioraptors is that these creatures Creatures hunt only in the dark, and with the entire planet about to go dark, things are bound to go haywire. The clock's ticking now as they hustle back to the crash site to grab the power cells and round up the rest of the survivors before the lights go out. Back at the crash site, the eclipse marks the beginning of a living nightmare for everyone as the Bioraptors come in, crashing it hard. Amidst the chaos, Riddick bumps into Hassan in the wreck but fails to stop a Bioraptor from turning him into its next meal. As the survivors squabble over what to do next, Riddick defends Fry against John's and shows who the boss really is. Fry then reveals about Riddick's night vision goggles, except they're his eyes, making him the unofficial but reliable leader on this godforsaken dark planet. It was clear that only he could lead them to safety. Unfortunately, Paris dies, and Riddick also figures that Jack, the young boy is actually a girl whose cycle is leading the monsters right to them. John's bright idea to use Jack as a distraction and Bioraptor food actually ends up in him becoming Bioraptor bait, courtesy of Riddick. While dodging claws and teeth, Riddick and Imam Abu al-Walid trade barbs over fate, with Riddick playing the skeptic to the hilt. 
a Bioraptor's attempt on Jack's life turns into a fine display of Riddick's might, as he goes one-on-one -on -one and comes out on top. Down to a small group of four, Riddick hatches a plan to use bioluminescent worms as a monster deterrent. Fry, worried about Riddick flying alone, follows him and convinces him that no one should get left behind. Their final stretch to the ship is a mix of triumph and tragedy. How? Well, Fry lays down her life to save Riddick from a couple of Bioraptor ambushes. As they blast off, Riddick uses the ship's engines as a fiery bug spray for the Bioraptors. Later, when Jack tells their story to bounty hunters, they tell them that Riddick actually died, but we know it's far from the truth. Dark Fury After their escape, Riddick, Jack, and Imam hardly got a breather before the mercenary vessel Kublai Khan rounded them up. Riddick tried to trick the bad guys by impersonating William J. Johns' impression, but his cover was blown off as quickly as he pulled off this stunt. Next thing you know, Riddick used the ship's extinguishing foam to hide the heat signatures before launching a surprise attack on the Mercs. The plan was solid until the mercenaries played dirty by using Riddick's friends as leverage, which forced him to stand down. It wasn't surprising that the mercenaries had more than just captured their minds. Separated from his team, Riddick meets Kublai Khan's chief, Antonia Chillingsworth, who apparently has a hobby of taxidermy. She collects living, breathing criminals, freezes them into statues, and calls it art. And in her eyes, Riddick's the missing centerpiece to her macabre collection. Slapped with a bomb in his neck for a little extra persuasion, Riddick's thrown into a death match with the shrill, glow-in-the-dark aliens. True to form, Riddick turns the tables and takes out the shrill. In fact, he even removes the bomb before blasting a hole in the ship for a quick exit. But victory's short-lived as Chillingsworth lands a bullet in Riddick's shoulder. However, Jack steps into the fray and lands the final blow by taking Chillingsworth out with a shot that leaves Riddick and Imam more than a little rattled by her ruthlessness. And that's where they part ways. Finding a Purpose Riddick later stakes his claim on the frostbitten planet of UV-6. He spends half a decade mapping the ice and hunting whatever is brave enough to call it home. One chilly day, while seeking refuge from a blizzard, he ends up in a cave, only to find it's got a resident in the form of a monstrous alien with a taste for trouble. Riddick, being Riddick, ends the creature's life. She-Ra pops in, half impressed, half warning him that dodging death is one thing, but dodging destiny? That's a whole other ball game. She speaks about Butcher Bay and sends him on a trip down memory lane before getting down to brass tacks. She was here with a heads up about the Necromonger, he figured that it was high time he found out about the man behind the myths. Curious about the skeletons in his cosmic closet, Riddick asks for details. In response, he gets a sneak peek into the future, a teaser trailer for the chaos to come. Chronicles of Riddick Five years off the grid, Riddick's solitude on UV-6 is crashed by Tombs and his merry band of mercs, hunting him for a juicy 1.5 million bounty. Riddick deals with two of them on the spot, and plays a deadly game of cat and mouse with Tombs and his aides, which, of course, ends with Riddick getting the upper hand. He grills Tombs for info, then leaves him out in the cold, commandeering his ship and setting course for Helion Prime the bounty's source. In cryosleep, Riddick's dreams are haunted by She-Ra's revelations, hinting he's the last of the badass Furians. Landing on Helion Prime, Riddick's first stop is Imam's place in New Mecca, because he suspected Imam of backstabbing him. But Imam's clean. He just pointed the bounty hunters in Riddick's direction on behalf of someone else. That someone was Arion, an elemental envoy with a prophecy in her pocket saying Riddick's the universe's last hope against the Necromonger's brand of doom. Initially, Riddick was all about taking a hard pass until Imam told him about Jack, Riddick's protege turned criminal, who is now cooling her heels on crematoria. This personal stake was the kicker which pulled Riddick into the fray against his better judgment. Helion Prime's welcome committee mistakes Riddick for a spy and gives him a taste of local hospitality. After the dust settles, the real drama begins. You see, Jack was in trouble, and Riddick, despite his lone wolf status, could not help but feel the tug of a brother's duty. The necromonger onslaught on Helion Prime was a blitzkrieg that turned the planet 
its defenses to dust overnight. Amidst the chaos, Riddick watches Imam fall, defending his kin, a loss that lights a fire in Riddick's heart. He storms the city forum and cuts down Imam's killer, Ergen. And, needless to say, this drew the curious eye of the Lord Marshal himself. Swept into the Necromonger Fortress, Riddick's pitted against the Quasi-Deads, whose psychic talents peg him for a Furion. The Lord Marshal, smelling trouble, orders a hit. But death's not on Riddick's agenda, and with a sly assist from the Purifier, he's back in the shadows. So yeah, he dodged a grave once more. Toombs re-enters the picture, eager to cash in on Riddick's head with a beefed-up crew. Yet, Riddick's got bigger fish to fry. Kira, formerly known as Jack, is cooling her heels on Crematoria. Playing the long game, Riddick plays the part of the captured to reach the Inferno. Crematoria's welcome is as warm as its reputation, but Riddick's reunion with Kira is anything but. Their catch-up is rudely interrupted by feeding time, turning the yard into a buffet for hellhounds. Riddick, in a show of alpha dominance, locks eyes with the beast and turns it into a pet. Later, he demonstrates his don't mess with me vibe by taking out a guard with a teacup, coming to Kira's defense. This heart-to-heart -heart with Kira is a rocky one, with blame and past decisions hanging heavy between them. Yet, amidst the hellfire and harrowing escapes, they find a way to bridge the gap, rekindling the bond forged in darker times. So yeah, in the darkest of places, Riddick's light shines the brightest, not as a hero in the traditional sense, but as a force of nature, relentless, indomitable, and unyielding. In a fight that was as brutal as it was dramatic, Vako and Riddick engaged each other, with Vako barely scraping a win. But just when the curtain was about to drop on Riddick, a surge of power, courtesy of Shira, blasts through the scene. Vako thought he had the upper hand, and left Riddick to fry under Crematorium's harsh sun, before leaving with Kira and the crew, who were convinced Riddick checked out for good. Riddick, teetering on the edge of a toasty death, gets a last-minute save from the Purifier, who had a lot to say about a juicy bit of space politics. If Vako died, the Lord Marshal was ready to cut Riddick a deal for a peaceful life, as long as he shelved his assassin plans. But Vako was likely to fake Riddick's death to save face, leaving the Lord Marshal open for a sneak attack. In a poignant exit, the Purifier reveals himself as a Furion before embracing a fiery end under Crematoria's son. Back at Necro HQ, Vako gets a pat on the back and a promotion from the Lord Marshal, oblivious to the storm brewing. Riddick, never one to let a little thing like near death slow him down, pilots Tombs' ship back to Helion Prime with a rescue mission on his mind. The Lord Marshal, with a hint of doubt about Riddick's demise, hits the panic button with the Ascension Protocol, aiming to turn Helion Prime into a cosmic graveyard. Dame Vako, with an eye for opportunity, notices Riddick sneaking into the Basilica and hatches a plan. Let Riddick take a swing at the Lord Marshal, soften him up, and then Vako can swoop in for the kill snagging the top spot in true necromonger fashion. Because in their book, you keep what you kill. Slipping into the throne room decked out in soldier's gear, Riddick finds himself toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Lord Marshal, who reveals about Kira flipping sides to the necromonger fate. Riddick's got a bone to pick, seeing as the necromongers have pretty much wiped out anyone he ever gave a damn about. The fight that follows is epic. Riddick throws in everything he's got, but the Lord Marshal was playing with cheat codes, making it a rough go for our anti-hero. Just when it looked like the Lord Marshal was about to score the knockout, Kira came out of nowhere to backstab the bad guys. But it backfires, and she ends up on the wrong end of a spike thanks to the Lord Marshal. Vako tries to seize the moment to take out his boss, but misses by a hair. That's when Riddick lands the finishing blow by turning the Lord Marshal into the universe's deadliest kebab. The aftermath was not quite nice, as Kira was on her way out, leaving Riddick with a I was always with you that was more painful than any necromonger fist. Next thing he knew, Riddick was sitting on the throne, surrounded by knee-bent necromongers, chanting the you keep what you kill mantra. Suddenly, he had become the big cheese of the empire he despised. With a heavy heart and the throne now his, Riddick made his first call as boss, ordering the necromonger fleet to back off from Helion Prime, thereby saving the planet from a certain doom. So yeah, in this part of his life, Riddick went from Lone Wolf to Lord Marshal of the Necromongers. This won't take long. We entered his new cortex. Coming full circle. For five solid years, Riddick had been playing hooky from his Lord Marshal duties 
pretty much giving the Necromonger Creed the cold shoulder. Not a single sacred oath was muttered, nor was a step taken towards the underverbs. It's no surprise, then, that some of the brass gets itchy. And when you're the leader of a tribe of people who are the epitome of all things bad, you can expect them to send a string of assassins your way when they don't like you. Assassins came and went, and all of them died one way or another, which only proved that taking down Riddick was no small feat. Feeling a bit out of touch with his primal side, Riddick hatches a plan with Commander Vako to take a ride back to what he hopes is Furia. But when he lands on not Furia, he is greeted by a plot against him. One thing leads to another, and he falls off a cliff courtesy of Crone, which leads to the Necros betting on his death. But once again, as luck or fate would have it, Riddick shakes off the tumble with nothing more than a busted leg and his pride slightly dented. A close shave with a pack of native jackals, a dip in a sulfur pool to avoid detection, and Riddick was back in the game. With a DIY leg brace and a jackal pup by his side, he spends the next six months getting to know the lay of the land, including some charming locals known as mud demons. Armed with newfound immunity and a four-legged companion, Riddick cuts through the planet's dangers and makes his way to Mercenary Station P7. With a storm brewing and mud demons on the prowl, Riddick sends out a distress beacon and turns the table on any mercenary dumb enough to answer the call. Back to basics, indeed. Riddick's stent on Not Furia was a survival saga, yes, but it was also a return to form a reminder of the raw, untamed force of nature he embodies. We also meet Santana and Boss Johns, who are leading Merc crews with very different agendas. Santana was out for Riddick's head, while Johns wanted the scoop on his son's fate. Tensions boil over, and Riddick starts thinning the herd, all while playing keep away with their ship's power nodes. Attempts at negotiation go south real quick, thanks to Santana's itchy trigger finger. In the ensuing chaos, Riddick's jackal buddy jumps into the fray, meeting a tragic end at Santana's hands, with Riddick getting a tranquilizer dart for his troubles. Chained and cornered, Riddick is grilled by Boss Johns about his son, and our anti-hero shares a truth that doesn't sit well. The storm breaks, the mud demons gate crash, and all of this eventually leads to Santana's head getting split. Of course, we are to thank Riddick's boot and a machete for whatever happened to Santana. Freed in the nick of time, Riddick and the remaining mercs make a mad dash for the buried power nodes, with Riddick schooling Johns on the harsh realities of his son's choices. Stranded without their jet hogs, Riddick and Boss Johns are left trekking across a tempest-tossed plane, duking it out with mud demons. Riddick takes a hit, with a demon's tooth lodging itself in his chest. Totally believing in the phrase, every man for himself, Boss Johns grabs the node and bails, leaving Riddick to fend off a legion of demons with nothing but his fists and a blade. Climbing to safety, Riddick performed rudimentary surgery, or cauterization, on himself by pressing a scorching rock against his wound. Just as he's going mano a mano against a wave of mud demons, Boss John's ship swoops in for the save, courtesy of Dahl's timely intervention. Back on speaking terms, Boss John's hands over the keys to Santana's ship to Riddick, which basically meant that they took a rain check on their beef. As their ships drifted apart, Riddick was back in the game and headed towards a rendezvous with the Necromonger fleet, perched on the brink of crowning Vako as the new Lord Marshal. Riddick was not in the mood for pleasantries, cutting straight to the chase with Crone, who ends up on the business end of Riddick's impatience. Outgunned but never outclassed, Riddick has always managed to pave his way through all forms of betrayals, alliances, and the wilds of alien worlds with the cool head and iron will that define him. Standing at the threshold of the Underverse, Riddick's story has not yet ended. He is a lone wolf charting his course through a universe where trust is a luxury and survival is earned and fought for, not given. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone.